Tonight, I'm honored to have uh, two members from one of the most prominent organizations of the Black Power era, us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. C.R.D. Lisi and Mr. James and Tume. <laughs> Nearly everyone who considers themselves a student of the Black Power Movement has heard of us, but very few people know what the acronym US stands for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah I mean, one of the things that um, <laughs> was doctrine, I would yes, say, yes. was that, you know, us doesn't, was, didn't stand for anything. It was, it was us, just us, mm -hmm. black people, you know, and I, I know that there's been this United literature States. about the United Slaves or whatever and all this, um, but, and, and anyone who went through a doctrine class, I mean, when people wrote that they were infiltrators in us and they didn't know that <coughs> us stood for just that, us black people with the motto, anywhere we are, us is, um, you know how, how much, how deeply they are country. <coughs> because everybody had to go through an um, uh, advocacy class <laughs> and uh, learn the so-called 21 points. And that was the first of the 21 points. So us really stands for us black people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mtumek. Yes, sir. Basic information of when was us founded and who were the founders? Well, <clears throat> it was founded in 66, but Brother Halisi and I came along in 67. We were going to the meetings at the Aquarian Bookstore. We started listening to the lectures of uh, Maulana Kuranga, the Aquarian Bookstore, which held about, what, 30 people? About 30. 30, you know. And we would make our trek from Pasadena every Sunday, you know, and we kind of, I, I would, let me see if you agree, I'm sure you will. Uh, we were the students, you know, we were coming from the college aspect, and I think when we came, we brought that mentality to the organization. Because mm -hmm. when we came from Pasadena, it would be a, it would be a, what was that word? Mm -hmm. you, there'd, be, there'd be 15 cars. You know, some of them buses. Remember the Volkswagen bus? We have one of them. <laughs> but we brought, I think when we came, it started to gallop in terms of around the colleges and, and those who were involved on that level. As a matter of fact, uh, Brother Halisi and I uh, co-founded the first um, Black Student Union in Southern California. And uh, that, that's when it began to gallop. But we came along 66, but really got, we kind of bought into it totally by 67. Right, and we had, a, we had a really, our first kind of in, interaction with Maulana was we had a debate on campus, um, and there was, a, uh, there was a white professor there, Jerome Wolf, I think his name was, and um, when the book Black Moses came out, which was a kind of scathing critique of Garvey, mm. we, wanted, we wanted to find someone to uh, counter, you know, the argument that Wolf was making on on campus, so we had we had Maulana come and we staged a debate between uh, Wolf and Maulana on the whole legacy of uh, Marcus Garvey. I mean, to show how small the black community is, we come. Yes, not only do I have very old friends here that go back to the organization days and our relationship with. Um, Amir Barak and others on the East Coast, but uh, Jamia, who has moved to Columbus from Pasadena. There she, she's was, right there. Was, was there. Yeah. She doesn't yeah. want me to say this because she doesn't want people to know her real age. Yeah. <laughs> we, we actually graduated from high school together. Wow. So, um, you know, and she was, she, was, she was one of the people that used to, you know, come to the, to the meetings at Pasadena City College, etc. So we started out as you know a black student union and and basically kind of integrated uh, many of the people we had recruited in, into us organization. All right. Now, um, brother Tumek. Yes, sir. You and brother Lisi co-founded the BSU. 
in SoCal. What campus was that? Uh, Pasadena City College. Pasadena City yes, College. Now you mentioned, you mentioned that the organization was founded in 66, yet all the literature says 1965. Well, that's possible. I'm telling you what we got down. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're, Maulana and Hakeem Jamal and others had had various, had various kind of um, uh, forerunner, small forerunner organizations. But the, you know, the organization really took off in 1966 and that was a period from which it sustained itself. And I mean, the us that everybody knows. But there were, you know, uh, Malana Karinga had been active in the uh, Los Angeles area. He had taught Swahili at Fremont High School, which has a whole history of um, racial confrontation. It used to be a white high school. Um, and, and he attracted many people uh, into, um, you know, into us from, from the Swahili class. That's the union kid. He was, he was the first, one of the first black presidents of the, uh, Afro of, not Afro-American, just the um, he was student, the whole entire student union at LACC. Okay. So, you know, he had been active and uh, had, had had some other smaller organizations. There's some controversy over whether, you know, what extent he and Hakeem Jamal, who was one of Malcolm, was an was uh, in-law of Malcolm X. Okay. Uh, you know, which one of them, or did they together come up with the idea of us? But, but, but the organization really took off around in 66, you know, and, and that's the organization that, that, that was active during the Black Power period. Okay, so of, of all the organizations in SoCal, um, what attracted you to us? Why did you join us? I really was just looking for an organization to join. Um, after 1965, you know, you had the Watts Revolt. Uh, and Tume and I, for example, I was a football player, you can believe it. Um, and he had a national time in, in the backstroke. He came from Philadelphia to train with a particular uh, swimming coach there. And then kind of 1965 happened, the Watts Revolt happened, we were all radicalized. I, we were looking for something to join. And you know, my mom and had a lot of visibility in that area. There was a, a debate on Joe Pine. Right. Show we all went down and heard heard him debate. Um, and you know, we just were. Uh, he just had had a structure and um, you know uh, a pretty coherent ideology. And uh, we weren't you know we weren't attracted to to us because it was us. In fact, I'm, I'm sure uh, circumstances could have led to us joining the Panthers or, <laughs> yeah. you know, or, yeah. or, or Tommy Jaquette, who founded the mm -hmm. Watts Festival, was someone who, you know, the first time I met him, um, you know, I asked, did he have an organization? I wanted to join that organization. He didn't really, he was kind of a one-man show, but he talked as if he had an organization. Slant. And Slant, mm -hmm. it's called mm -hmm. Slant. And, uh, you know, he, he, and, and, and he said, don't worry, brother, you don't have to find him. Uh, don't worry about finding a revolution, the revolution will find you. <laughs> and so, um, I guess it eventually did. Mm -hmm. Brother Tume, yeah. would you mind answering that question? Well, I think, well, well, before I say anything, I want y'all to, to, to know this. Me and this brother, the last time we were in a forum together was in 1968. Wow. Today is the first time we've been together. Wow. Right. You know, I just, I, I, I just want to y'all to know. So I'm sitting there asking questions, but I'm really gassed to be with my man again, you know? Uh, brother, if I were to make it succinct, I would say we were attracted to the intellect. You know, the, the ideology is one thing, but that was one compon component of what uh, uh, Karanga was dealing with. We also did studies, sometimes we would go back and forth with developing witticisms. It was about elevating your intellect within the context of the black power movement. Uh, some organizations, I, in, in a way, nationalism became like a, a secular theology. You know how people in search of what church you gonna go to? Well, that's how it was in the movement. And, and, and certain people who were drawn to certain things. We were drawn to the intellect and also the promise of what we could bring to it intellectually. 
Because when we looked around, a lot of nationalist movements, it's important to deal with protests, it's important to deal with you know, uh, consciousness, but we didn't see anybody trying to develop the intellect the way Kawaii was. And as, as, as Alessi said, we had, we, you know, I took the advocacy class. He was the imam move. So between the two of us, it was like, that's where you got it from. And, and, unless you were talking direct to uh, Maulana. I don't mean that in any ego, but when he's talking about the points, they were like, what, about, at that point, 70-something points of Kawaii. And we were very diligent about it. But it was the internet. And, and I mean, and that led us early on to, to want to edit the quotable Karinga, oh, right? Which we, <laughs> you know, the two of us sat down one night, and um, we we took we always took uh, down quotes and ideas, tapes, and and listened to the tapes. And so we said, man, we need to we need to pull some of these these quotes and put them together. So you know, we we pulled together the little the quotable Karinga, a little green book. And I'm, I'm, you know, we never had it in, in formally in bookstores or whatever. But I'm sure through straight peddling, we, we did sell it. I'm sure we sold yeah. a million copies yeah. you know, Easy. <laughs> over many, many years. So it was, uh, you know, it, it turned out to be a real easy way to expose people to the organization and its ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, interestingly, I bought, I bought my copy in 1993 in, in a used bookstore on, on, on Denka. <laughs> Wow. The more wow. So now, other than students, besides students, what kind of people joined us? Well, you know, um, when, when, when we came to the organization, Maulana had, you know, had uh, a small group of followers, uh, people like uh, Akima, uh, Tommy, Tommy Jaquette, M. Samaji, eventually Heshimu, and Sagidi, who, who were um, really well known in the LA area, um, had been track stars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know they, they were they were more from LA. They were kind of more of an LA contingent. The Pasadena contingent, like M. Tumi said, we were we came out of a student movement that we organized and then gradually brought people. But um, all kind of people joined us organization and. Uh, one of the one of the things that is often not appreciated when, uh, which I'm sure we'll get to, uh, the Panther us conflict was that us captured uh, when the, the Maulana had this idea he and a, 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 a brother named Damu of a youth movement, and you, if anybody remembers that that famous picture on Life magazine mm -hmm. with Damu and the and, and the young Simba, and uh, you know a Saturday school, etc. But he had this idea of, of a youth movement. Eventually, you know, um, us wound up capturing many of the leadership of the gladiators, while the Slawsons tended to, to, to uh, you know, move toward the Panther part. And uh, so you had young, you had young people who were, who had been in gangs, had reached that kind of age. Where they, you know, where where that wasn't enough for them, and they wanted something. And when they heard Kawaida, you know, one person joined, and you know, they had all been, they had all been in gangs together. And you know, the next thing you know, you got you know many ex members of the Gladiators. Um, uh, us also attracted very well on the uh, uh, from the children. Um, uh, you know, sons and daughters of of West Side LA, which was supposed mm -hmm. to be, you know, more middle class. Mm -hmm. So you know, a Sunday soul session could easily have, um, you know, people who would ordinarily seem to be middle class. And my line of work, you know, he already had an AB. He was ABD from UCLA in African Studies. So he worked closely with the professional community. That that led to the. Um, Black Congress, so um, you know us. We 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 have, we attracted across, uh, I think across uh, class and age, and age lines. But but mostly young, you know, mostly young people. You have to remember at the time that the organization was founded, Maulana himself was only 25 years old. 
Yeah, and that's a very important point. The age that we all were vibing in. I mean, the leader himself was 25. I think I was 18, 19 years old doing this work. But to, to, for those that want to have a, a, a much more in-depth understanding of what Brother Halisi was talking about, there's a wonderful documentary called Bastards of the Party. It was done on HBO. You can go on YouTube and find it. It is the most clear breakdown of the development of the gangs in LA, starting with the 50s. It deals with the sponsors and all, and it goes up to us organization and the Panthers. And these gangsters became the children after, this, after the whole thing fell apart between us and the Panthers at the uh, infamous UCLA shootout, because we will get to that, and I think you're gonna hear some stuff from the two of us that you never heard that never came out of the trials. But if you get a chance, go on YouTube or HBO, Bastards of the Party, and it shows that the Crips and the Bloods were a result of the absence of us and the Panthers. So now, um, when you think of black power organizations, there's something that distinguishes one from the other, right? <coughs> so when you think about us, what are the one or two things that distinguishes us from the Panthers, Republican, New Africa League of Revolutionary Black Workers, Discipline. and on and on and on? Discipline. Um, you know, one of the things is that when, when uh, the Black Power Movement really started gaining a lot of, um, uh, you know, notoriety, um, you know, Maulana Karingo was quick to, you know, to meet people like Stokely Carmichael and attach them and said, you know, from the beginning, us is an arm of the black power movement. So, uh, you know, so we were, uh, you know, so, so we were there the first time Stokely Carmichael uh, ever came to speak to, um, to speak in LA. We were with security at, at the talk at what was then Will Rogers Park. Um, so that was one thing, but I think in our own mind, the one thing that we felt that distinguished us from other uh, black power organizations was we believe in that uh, as was you know as was part of our argument when you know we gave speeches you know education is alone is not the answer um, you know politics alone is not the answer that what black people really needed was reculturalization mm -hmm. that we needed to re we needed to re-culturize um, black folk because we had lost our culture. Thus, you know, the kind of sometimes pejorative, you know, name of cultural nationalism, uh, which was not what we called ourselves. But, um, you know, it was this idea that you had to, you know, that went along with the name change, you know, the whole kind of, the whole kind of idea that you had to remake yourself, you know, into a new cultural uh, black person. So our thing was, you know, like rethinking culture, new values, because uh, as Maulana would argue, values is the measure of the worth of a thing. Black people had lost that sense of what was valuable. And, and us, more than anything else, saw itself as, as, as the kind of fundamental instrument for, um, for creating uh, a, a new black culture. And in that way, we were, you know, we felt that that was the distinguishing uh, position uh, of, of our organization. And as you were talking, brother, I was thinking, unfortunately, what we had planned to do was never able to be actualized. The initial plan was that those students that came out of Kawaida, we was all supposed to go out to different cities and establish temples. Unfortunately, when, when things started getting, you know, the, the stuff we'll get to later, we, we never got outside of, of LA. We got outside of LA in terms of intellectual and ideological influence, but we physically didn't get out there like the Panthers did. And I think well, we, we talk about that all the time. That was a fundamental flaw, because we had this information, but it's, it, it almost became sui generis. We, we just doing it in LA. 
And, uh, and, and that led to, as, as Brother Halisi said, we never thought of ourselves as cultural masters. That was put on us. Now, 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 brother, let me, let me just add one little more point on that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, there were, I mean, in the organization, there was a real, there was a principal discussion about, you know, how we should branch out. We said, you know, uh, you, you, know, you kind of had the Muslim model, all you had to do is be in jail, write a letter to Elijah Muhammad, <laughs> and we felt like, you know, there were whole cadres of, of FBI inside the Muslim. With the Panther model, they they grew very rapidly in in urban areas. Many you know many many uh, people identified with them, but we felt like we did not want to move to cities where we hadn't had long interaction mm -hmm. with the groups that would become Kawaii, the groups or the leaders that would you know were ahead of those groups. So our position was that was just you know, we would grow slowly. So we did wind up having a branch in San Diego, and as, as, as you know, uh, Amiri Barak on the East Coast for, for a period of time was, you know, considered himself a Kawaido organization and, you know, his famous track on um, um, the principles, et cetera, um, the black value system. So it wasn't, you know, we, we really thought that, uh, and, and you had to think about Infiltration. It was it was a constant it was a constant issue, and so we we thought we we, we kind of to a, a purposeful extent opted for this rather you know slow growth model with with intimate relations with the people who we you know who we um, bestowed kind of uh, kawi you know bestowed the reign of, of a kawaii organization on. Yeah, I was going to say to our brother too, man, that you were being a bit modest because I knew you all had um, branched out in San Diego, so I didn't want to give the audience the impression. That you oh no, so no, 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 no. Um, yeah, San Diego and Newark, mm. basically. Uh, what I was saying was, and, and, he, and, and, and Halise is correct. We had we had dialogue back and forth for that. I was always of the opinion that sometimes you just have to go to a place. Now, I understood the slowness, but uh, at, the, the, at the end of the day, you don't have control over the events that happen. Once UCLA went down, we then withdrew even further. But had we had those temples, you know, hey, hey columns around the country, uh, I just thought of it the way that uh, Elijah Muhammad did it. Uh, people forget when Master Farad Muhammad left Detroit, he left Elijah Muhammad in charge. And his brother got together with another dude, and they they planned to assassinate him. After that, he went to he, he had to sneak out, dress in disguise, and travel the country to places he had never been. But he, just the idea of establishing. Now, like I said, it's a legitimate point on both sides. But history proves that when certain events happen that you have no control over, it's like Katrina. You don't have control over that. UCLA, we became even more withdrawn and paranoid after a certain period. But I always felt, had we had those other hey, columns, that helps spread the message and also uh, spread legitimacy. So now, you mentioned um, the thing that distinguished us from these other black power organizations. One of the things that get lost in the conversation about us are the community programs that you all had that people took advantage of. Very rarely do you hear anything about that. Can you talk a little bit about that, just briefly? I mean, us, you know, us purposely, I mean, if you think about the way we were organized, us uh, really did try and carry out the model anywhere we are, us is. So any black organization that was, or any program that was happening in the community, you know, us felt a personal responsibility to have have members there. Right. Um, we had a, a, an extensive system of, of following what was going on in the community, reporting on those things, joining organizations that were, um, you know, that we thought were were important for us to be, you know, engaged in. So, um, and, and that meant very aware of, of political issues. I mean, if you really look at the Black Power Movement, one of the real debates 
uh, in the Black Power Movement was this whole question, and, and I, I think you might have even you know touched on in, 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 on your book on, on on Huey as a social theorist. I mean, this whole question of what kind of relationship, say for example, should we have with the electoral process? You know, Maulana was very um, aware, you know he was very keen. We had someone like Ken M. Samaji who was it was his. I mean, politicians were his beat. That's what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to know <coughs> what was happening with you know the black elected official. The first time that Dellums, for example, ran, us members sent people up to San Francisco to help leaflet. Um, many politicians paid the youth, our youth movement to tear down the posters and opponents of, 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 of this world. Right. You know, still um, goes on today. Not right? favored. Um, so, you know, uh, and then what grew out of this was the Black Congress, which was a kind of an organization that bridged, you know, kind of what was going on in the, in, in the Southern California Black militant community with um, the Black professional community. Well, and, well. and that meant, you know, us and the Panthers. The Panthers eventually, you know, uh, broke with the Black Congress, but for a period in time, the two organizations both had offices there. Um, many of the students um, that went into the high potential program at UCLA, which was another factor in, in this whole conflict, uh, they were primarily from us and the Panthers. Um, so, so us really uh, felt itself, uh, you know, felt that it needed to work in almost any kind of political engagement. Now, we had I guess what, what was a major difference, you know, we had, we had this idea that you, you make a distinction between coalitions and alliances. We would make coalitions with white causes that we thought were progressive, but only on a temporary, you know, whatever the cause was basis. But any third world people, us felt they could build an alliance. And a lot of people have the idea, us was not uh, Maulana was a third worldist when, a long time before, I guess, that became popular. He was a, he was a third worldist. We were anti-white, mm -hmm. but we, uh, we had Puerto Ricans, at that time we had Asians. I mean, anybody who was third That's world it. could join us. It was just, you know, we were, we saw ourselves <coughs> as a black nationalist organization, and we saw white people as our historic enemy. Um, the hour is getting late, so I'm going to transition, and then a few minutes opening up the Q and A to the okay, audience. Okay. So now, um, you know, years ago, uh, brother Lisa, we had this conversation about the gangs in, in Los Angeles, and um, you schooled me on the history of the gangs, and I, I, I came to believe, well, I came to wonder, to what degree um, did the fact that the SoCal chapter, the BPP, did a um, good job of recruiting members of the Slossons. Bunchy was a member of the Slossons. Then he was leader of this inner circle of the Slossons called the Slosson Renegades, right? And us did a pretty good job of recruiting from the Gladiators. So, you know, I often wondered over the years, um, given that, I wonder if there was already a built-in level of antagonism between the two groups that would um, eventually yeah. erupt no matter what. Uh, two things I want to just say, and I'll give it to him to me. You know, once when Bunchy first got out of jail, who was Bunchy? Bunchy Carter, Carter, who was one of, was the important leader of the, uh, the uh, Panthers in LA and is the, is the main kind of character in the uh, basses of the party, movie that Mtumi pointed out. The first time Bunchy got out of jail, he came down to, to us and, um, you know, we were getting ready to, do, to, to join the organization, uh, join the, uh, Black the, the meeting, and, uh, and um, to end, you know, to, to end the meeting. And, um, you know, he was, I think once he was taken back by how many seamers were Slawsons, because, I mean, I mean, I'm glad he is, because he's like, oh man, this, and he came back later on, and there was a conflict between, between uh, he brought some slots. Now, this is before he joined the Panther Party. Okay. Um, the other thing uh, I think that shaped the character of us, 
is that you had a lot of small, smaller organizations like say Robert Moanjuki and other lead other smaller groups. As as us began to de to develop ascendancy in LA, uh, many of those groups it po you know it pushed those many of those groups to the margin. Mm -hmm. um, before uh, when Shermont Banks was the head of the chapter in LA, we trained our organ our the Simbas and and Panthers together. As the, the San Francisco group did not did not approve of that, they came down. They kind of, they they pushed uh, Banks out of the leadership, and all of the other groups that uh, us had alienated one way or another, kind of got um, you know kind of gravitated toward the Panther Panther. So I always say from the very beginning, even before, there was a kind of an oppos oppositional you know, element to the Panther Us relationship in Los Angeles because many of the people who had been in the organization had been marginalized or had had beefs with us one way or another. Mm -hmm. And as us became hegemonic, you know, uh, and then the Panthers kind of became an equivalent force in the area, there was there was a tension that included <coughs> included the gangs and other organizations that were, you know, older than the gangs. And one of those organizations was the FBI. And so sometimes we forget how much mess is created. And uh, like for example, what, 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 what was one of the things surrounding the UCLA shootout, uh, because Halisa and I have both talked to the principal people that was from our organization about that. They told me, I, I went to where they were, that they were getting calls, this is before that meeting at UCLA, the start meeting. And somebody said, look, the Panthers are going to, they're going, they're going, they're going to try to kill you tomorrow. Meanwhile, the Panthers are getting the call. Our organization is trying to shoot you. So the, 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 exacer the, the thing got exasperated, but we got to understand, we never, we, and we used to talk about it all the time in the organization, oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the FBI, they, you know. And some people get so serious that it's, it's ludicrous, you know. Let's not say anything here. I don't know if the group is might. Yes, it's might. <laughs> okay? But you, you know, you get into that old conspiracy thing, but the reality was, sometimes you don't take it as seriously as it is. Like, for example, don't nobody forget the guy giving Malcolm mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation when he was assassinated was a cop who was one of his right-hand men in security. I've had a chance since you know being able to step back from it. I've been able to get some of my papers. Yeah. yeah. And some of the stuff is so true that I've been to, well, wait a minute. Who else was there? But that had a lot to do because and how at least he will attest to this. Bunchy was our boy, man. We hung out together, we wrote poetry together, we had lunch, and all of a sudden it just started getting mangled. But that reality, I don't want anybody to take that lightly. We both were played. But you know what? That's how they do. So now, um, so right now, Brother Lisa, Brother Two, and um, Brother Ray, if you could uh, dim the lights up here. I want to um, play a clip for you. It's very short. It's about a minute. And I'd like you to comment. Uh, <laughs> Wait a minute, what you want to play? <laughs> I want you to comment on what you, what you, what you see. <coughs> Hopefully this comes off without a hitch. They drew first. The us people drew in defense. And that's when the shootout happened. It's a tragic mistake. I don't understand why no one doesn't get that chart changes for any intensive purpose as much of an FBI, uh, FBI operative as anybody. He kills these two men. He shoots John in the back. And Bunchy turns around unarmed and gets shot straight up in the chest. When the Panthers and the left then began to lie about us, say we were Asians, say we killed the Panthers. This wasn't some casual event that happened accidentally when tempers flared. This was a planned assassination of a le of leaders of the Black Panther Party for a very specific reason. Because as J. Edgar Hoover had said, uh, 
we were the greatest threat and he was going to eliminate that threat. <laughs> yeah, I saw that movie. Um, and in fact, I think Elaine called my name out uh, in particular uh, and said that we had said we were going to get them. Listen, when you, when you look back on the situation, you, got, you, you, have, you have one or two explanations. The, the one explanation is the conspiracy explanation, which I, was, I would suggest that this is part of. The, um, the, uh, the other explanation is that you had two rival organizations, both armed, um, FBI uh, involvement, as Ntumi has pointed out, uh, the meeting was supposed to, th there was supposed to be a meeting that took place. In fact, uh, the one, and I think you might know him, Syl Whitaker, who used to be the Dean of Social Sciences when you were there at USC, um, he has passed away now. But Syl, you know, confided in me, he was always very um, guilty because he was supposed to be at that meeting at, at Bunch Hall, at Campbell Hall, and um, at Campbell Hall, and at the time he was an alcoholic, which he, you know, later, you know, went to alcoholics now to straighten his life up. But he was supposed to be at that meeting. So subsequently, students were roaming around. Uh, at the time, there had been some provocative. Uh, um, the Panthers had rounded up some of the leaders of the Black Student Union. Um, so as a result, those students who had been recruited into the high potential program, who were um, on the campus, I was not at UC, I was not at UCLA at the time. Those students also started carrying their arms. So you have one or two explanations. You can go with the conspiracy theory, or you can go with the, the theory that it was a spontaneous, it was a spontaneous outburst in the midst of this of this politically tense situation. Now remember, uh, uh, one of the brothers was talking to Elaine Brown, who used to date her. A ZZ Glover was Elaine's roommate. At but ZZ was from us. Was yeah. from us. Was 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 Elaine's roommate. So you know, it, it's going to. I don't know. I don't, and some. I think a, there's a young, younger generation of scholars who have been trying who tried to sort that out. But you know, you can do you can do this kind of conspiracy thing. Uh, and Elaine, of course, is at odds with many of uh, uh, Kathleen and many others. Uh, herself, but at the same time, you can, you're going to go one or two ways. You're going to see that this was an FBI conspiracy. That was the Panther line at the time. The Panthers had access to the left. We had, because we were, you know, not in coalition with white organizations, we certainly didn't have a chance to get our uh, interpretation out. So either it was a spontaneous outbreak, and, and the reason, uh, I, I don't know why Joe Chase was never captured. I mean, the Steiner brothers, I know several women who were in the room, the Steiner brothers who got who went to jail and one is still in San Quentin, were laying on the floor. And it always it's always told as if the Steiner brothers got out of jail right away. You remember, they were in jail for five years. So if the police were, were letting them out, they damn sure took their time. So, you know, so you know, that's the two that's the two approaches. Either you do, either it was this kind of spontaneous outbreak in the midst of tension. That's that's what I think happened, or you know, it was all um, manipulated by the FBI. You you know, you have to make a choice. It's up it's up to whatever you think. And, and let me add to uh, what Brother just said. Uh, this, there's other information that has to be put in the equation. As Halisi alluded to. Elaine Brown was dealing with one of the brothers in us, and also John Huggins, who was the other brother that was killed. This had a lot, all this stuff moved, this motion going around. The other thing is, one of the brothers from us was shot. That never came out. He was shot. Here's what happened. We're up here. Let's say the Panthers, oh, you represent a few, y'all represent. It was a shootout. Now, when, when, when it went down, one of the brothers from us is shot. You never hear about that. And you never hear about the fact that when, it, this, when, this, when the brothers from us raised to shoot is when they thought the third brother from us 
was in harm's way because the guns had been pulled. Look, Ger Geronimo Pratt was there. He said it was all BS. So was Joe Brown, you know the guy you watch on TV? Yeah. Just Joe Brown, he was there. Mm. He was in the Panthers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the history is Judge above. Joe Brown. Judge Joe Brown. <laughs> Get out of my court, right. But the bottom line is, you've got to understand the thing in context. And here's what, I'm, what I want to bring to it. When it went down, remember we all called to the Sun House and we sat around, and what was the lawyer's name? Frank Evans. Uh, Frank Evans. Sharia. Sharia. Sharia law. <laughs> <laughs> but here's a call on the series note. We were into, they couldn't be held for murder. At best, it would have been self defense. They were never tried for murder. Out of all the stuff you hear it, the trial was not about them being tried for murder. They tried them for conspiracy to commit murder. Right. Now, let me understand the words game here. Right. They were never, everything you hear, they gunned them down, they gunned these two brothers. You didn't know, most of y'all don't know, because that didn't come out. It's not your fault, it's, it's how you deal with information. They don't let that part out. They went to prison for the conspiracy to, 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 to commit murder. Now, why did they have to do that? Because if it was, if, you have, if we're in a shootout, part of that is self-defense. Right. So that never came up in the court case. And also, the guns that John Huggins and Bunchy had were scooped up. Geronimo Pratt has stood by that story. But also, you have to deal with the bullets that missed. Now, if, if, if that's us, or if, if we're us organization, we're shooting at you. There's some bullets in that wall. They removed that wall. The, the, the idea of the bullets come being brought to trial, they, 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 knew, they knew they couldn't win that one. Because you've got to bring yourself to defense. They went to prison for conspiracy. And the other, the, the other thing about conspiracy is that, and, and this has been true of Watani uh, Steiner, you, when the court case goes to appeal, the facts of the case are not relitigated. Right. What is relitigated, you know, what cannot be relitigated is the conspiracy mm -hmm. because they weren't arrested for the for murder. They, had them to point. they were arrested for conspiracy. So how do you defend yourself against conspiracy? Mm -hmm. So this is this, this would be our response to this. I mean, and and you know. Mm -hmm. That film was a lovely film. It, it was one of my positions was this: the growth of a Panther historiography is going would mean reopening the issue of us, because if you're really going to tell the story of the Panthers, you're not going to be able to overlook that situation. Yes, you mean you know? I mean, after Bunchy and John were killed, there was tremendous anger. It led to. Uh, a turf war in LA. It probably led to the destruction of the Black Congress. Uh, no, probably it did. So um, yeah, you know that the, 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 there was silence. You know, to, the, the, we, we couldn't say anything. We were, were ordered not to say. Did not respond. There was, you know, the Panthers had a, had a, a paper that was distributed nationally. So you know, it was it was it was a it was a dark period for us because of the fact that you know we were maligned the way the way we were. So, and as far as people, you know, with this whole, you know, Swearinger and, you know, surveillance of America and, and all the people who have, you know, made a, have an industry investment in, in, in conspiracy theory, you're not gonna, you're not gonna persuade them. But what I'm telling you is that you have to make your mind up. Either you know the, the details as, as many of us do, and you know it was this kind of a spontaneous outburst in the midst of what was a rival, you know, a tense situation, or you believe that, you know, us was somehow uh, in league with the FBI. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't remember. I mean, that, that pretty much is what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just um, I have a point of information now. Uh, Judge Brown says that he was not a member of the BPP, but he was a student of Black Panther uh, politics, but was not official <coughs> the other thing I want to mention. I mean, is, I will, I, wouldn't you expect him to say that? Oh well, yeah, no. <laughs> but, but, but 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 Panthers like Hillier and others say that he was not a member of the BP people, that he was a sympathizer. Oh, okay. So that's All right. right. But he was there. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. No doubt about right. that. That's that's my point. He's no, he doesn't deny that. Right. The other thing I want to mention is that when the repression of Black Power era groups um, is discussed a lot of emphasis is placed on the FBI, right? And you know, when, when I go to conferences, I make claim that, hey, listen, you know, I had thousands upon thousands 
of documents from the Department of Justice. And oftentimes, what I find is, yeah, the FBI is playing a role, but oftentimes what they're doing is going to cities and getting local cops mm -hmm. to do that dirty work. Mm -hmm. In New York, you would have Boss, right? Um, mm -hmm. LA, SWAT, Crash. So I just thought I'd mention yeah. that. Well, I mean, for, for, example, for example, the vice chairman of us, uh, uh, James Dos Tariadi, his home was machine gun. They distributed leaflets. They tried to make it, they, they tried to make it. And actually, the person had been a member of the Panthers, but it was, you know, disclosed that he was a ex policeman. So, you know, um, they were they were actually, you know, they were actually using violence on the different groups to provoke violence. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that there was no conflict between the two groups, okay, no but you know, I mean, you, you, it's just what was the spark that set off that shooting at at, at UCLA because that's the that's the real that's the real issue. Now, you know, my last point, Brother Lee, before we throw it out to the um, um, audience, because everyone's going to be out in this building by 7.30, <laughs> all right? So now, you mentioned that if you're going to do a history of uh, Black Panther Party, you have to talk about us. Now, you remember, in my piece about us, right, me and Floyd, a colleague of yours from um, um, days back in Southern Cal, we deliberately, right, um, stated that, you know, the, the Panthers and the us history are inexpensive inextricably linked, but for better and for worse, right? Because oftentimes, the Panther Party, often, not always, oftentimes the Panther Party, right, is couched by scholars in a favorable light. Oftentimes, that's not the case with us. Oftentimes, us is seen as the organization that killed Bungie Carter, first and, and foremost, right. and John Huggins. And what we were saying in our chapters, hey, listen, listen, listen. Both these organizations have a history of their own, right. right? And to frame these organizations, right, around that incident does a disservice to both, and especially, especially the us organization. Right, and, and I think Floyd, you know, knows, you know, I mean, your, your co-author, I think it was Floyd who was the head of the the Black Student Union is what happened. The, the thing that triggered it was that um, there was there was they were going to develop an African American Studies Center at UCLA. Mm -hmm. The the Black Study the the the, student, the African American Student Union <coughs> didn't trust the university to do right all the way. Right. So they invited the Black Congress in, which meant Walt Greenman and Mala Rockeringa in to kind of look over the shoulder of the university. They go through a whole process, they select uh, a, um, a director. In the meantime, Floyd, I think, is overthrown or he leaves, he was a graduate student anyway, he leaves as the head of the African American Student Union. The union swings to become a Panther Union and um, Malana comes, gives this speech to students that said, look, you asked us to be involved. And you know, it, and the way he did it, I admit it was provocative and the students were angry. The, uh, you asked us to be involved, we've selected a director and you're gonna just have to live with that. Mm -hmm. And that really, ten, you know, that, that kind of fed in to, to the tension that was going on in campus. So Floyd knows very well uh, some of those inner details. I think that's why you know he, you know he, he you know uh, advocates a more open-minded position. You know as you do. Yeah, yeah. And for the record, yeah, he stepped down. He stepped down. Right. <coughs> Before we go to the audience, there's a couple of things we have to keep in mind. If you don't define yourself, mm -hmm. you leave yourself open to be defined by others. That is also what happened to us. We were told not to respond, but all this pressure was building. Uh, we couldn't respond because, you know, we were following orders. Although, intuitively, people like Brother Halisi and myself, and I'm sure a couple others were like, How, we can't take these kind of shots and not give up our, 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 our statement. But we were told to stand down, and we did. And as a result of that, people come to conclusions based on three things. Image, implication, and impact. Now, what do I mean by that? The image of us became, okay, murderers. 
And that not only murders, we, we, we murdered a hero of the movement, Bunchy. Implication. I don't trust him. They, they, they may do anything. The impact becomes isolate yourself from them. We have become isolated because we were told to stay silent. And that went against every instinct in our fiber. But we were soldiers. And, but and, uh, historically, it was the wrong point. We never got, having these moments like this, we should have been out there in the community. But we were shut down. Nobody heard our story. And as Halisi said, the Panthers had been infiltrated by the left at that point. They couldn't get in us. They did get in there. And they brought this other act, the apparatus of a national newspaper. And then we started seeing things, the Karangatangs, you know, the uh, cultural nationalists against revolutionary that was all stupid. But they had a program and they had a propaganda on. We didn't participate in it and we lost the battle for the minds of the people. Now, you know, you know, brother too, man, I mean you just you just taught me something. Man. In all of these years, I did not know that you all were ordered. I did yeah. not know that you all yeah. were ordered to basically stand up, you don't know not pain. respond. You don't, you, and you feel you, you, you can't do nothing. We were ordered not to respond. You never saw one article that came that emanated from us. Mm. While at the same time, when you read the Black Panther newspaper, you all are being framed as enemies of the people. Right. Mm. Questions from the audience? Oh, Mr. Wright. You said something earlier, Brother Toomey, um, that the Crips and the Bloods came because of a vacuum left by us and the Black Panthers. I, I heard someone express that same thing about the violence that's going on in Chicago right now, that, that the old, old gang members Black are Stone Rangers and, the, yeah. and gone, so now the youth there are, are, are kind of... See, one of the things about the gangs, you know, I'm from South Philly, you know, when I came to California, you from New Orleans, right? I, but I'm from South Philly, okay? The gang thing was, was heavy, but there was an order. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, you gotta put your, there was always an order to it. You know, nobody was beating up nobody's mother. They weren't robbing old women going into the laundromat. But then something happened, especially during the crack era. The crack era came in, and this is, this is a fundamental thing we should always be clear about. All Movements like the, the mafia, you had the, you had the Irish mafia, you had the Jewish mafia. They were grown men and women. We developed a generation of underground that was kids. All the other people had dropped off because they got access to guns. All of a sudden, the crack uh, era was dominated by kids 18, 19 years old. There was no order because all the old gangsters they were already been, being put in jail. But what they didn't understand, the new ones coming up had no respect for anything. So the young gangs today, they don't even have an order. There is no OGs. You're OG at 19. And, that, and that's for real. We got a situation in Newark. There are 11 and 12 year olds now are carrying guns and robbing people. This thing is way deeper than all this. We talk about the debates and all that. The main threat to us right now is us, and we've divorced ourselves from our children. Right. And if we do this any further, we will be annihilated. Right. And one, one other point about the I'm gang thing. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get well, no, no, but one other point about the gang thing was the police, when us and the Panthers were on the scene, the police helped the gangs to rise. So they used the gangs as a transitional period to get rid of the militants, they made a clear choice that the militants were more of a threat than the gang. Right. They helped, and then, you know, they, they always had a very funny relationship because they were very clear that gangs were preferable to militants. They had a very clear understanding. Okay. Sister Shepard? I wanted to ask uh, Halisi and Brother Tumay, one or both of you, um, say going back, so when you joined us, your philosophy and what you thought about black people, what you hoped for versus today, how far have you progressed as a people? And wow. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> I, I mean, one of the things we, we said, one of the quotes from Kruger was about a rat on a cylinder, right? 
and we like rats on the cylinder. Here we are again, I think uh, we could use a new cultural nationalist movement that began to redefine values and redefine you know, meaning and many of the issues for a new generation. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, I disagree with Elaine on most things, but one thing she said when she came to speak at Cal State, and, and, and you, you alluded to this in your introduction, that uh, somebody asked her, you know, you know, what should they be doing? And she went off and she said, I'm 65 years old. You know, when I was in my 20s, you know, I started, we were in an organization. We started organizations. Don't, you know, don't ask me what you should be doing, you know, and I'm in my sixth. You do, you do what you know needs to be done. So um, I think, you know, I think many of those issues of, of uh, rethinking our values and what's important to us as a community are as relevant as they ever were. That's an excellent question. I can tell you where I was, where I was coming from. You know, I was more into arts. I mean, more well, obviously music. I came out of a musical family, the Heath brothers. Um, me and my father, Jimmy Heath, Percy Heath was, it was the bass player from the modern jazz quartet. My uncle Tootie's played with everybody from Coltrane. So, and we were just talking about this in your office. I've had, I had the experiences of like being nine, 10 years old, sitting at the dinner table, Here's Coltrane, here's Monk, here's Dizzy Gillespie. You know, here's Sonny Rollins. They come to dinner when they would be in Philly. And my father was really cool because he always said he saw something in me that even though I was that young and he just said, I know you don't understand how deep this is, but he would let me sit there when they would talk about mm -hmm. concept. And I'm gonna tell you right now, jazz musicians are the baddest people on the planet. Yeah. And something about that, I think, yeah. Jazz merges the highest point of emotion and intellect. Yes. You gotta get that feeling, but it's so structured that if you don't study, you can't play it. But I came out of that, and when I joined the organization, at least he had that same, same sensibility. And I think we were drawn to each other immediately. We were like kinda in a way, the beat mix in there, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, you know. But we were down for the intellect, but we always had that other side. We'd be sliding out, going to the clubs, you know. He would tell you, call me, yo, so and so's in town. Oh, we there. <laughs> but I think what has happened now, you gotta respect each generation. It's, and I, I always use music as, as the parallel. You know, it's like a lot of older people dog hip hop. I mean, some of that stuff I don't, I don't like, but that's their music. And you take some of the negative lyrics out, yeah, but remember, we were, we're responsible for what they became because we worked there. And this stuff was building a bit way before it was niggas with attitude. That music was building, we didn't pay no attention to it. We paid attention to it when we felt uncomfortable about it. And then what did we do? We're gonna roll over the uh, Reverend Butts, we're gonna put all our albums in Mill Street and bulldoze them, come on, man. Right. We fundamentally have had a breakdown of the cultural continuity between old and young. The struggle right now ain't to just get, get it right with white people. We gotta get it right with the children that we born on this earth, that we dissected ourselves with, especially black men. Because sisters, we carry this load forever. But that's a mirror we got to look at, and I guess that's another conversation. <laughs> back, back there in the red. You always hear rumors about internal issues between uh, with the Panthers and the US organization and taking into consideration the FBI slash COINTELPRO. How many of those rumors, and I know there are tons of them, and um, are really accurate? And knowing <coughs> that COINTELPRO had targeted Ed Bradley, or uh, Tom Bradley, and um, Leslie Shaw, the first black postmaster in Los Angeles, and Martin Luther King and everyone else. So how does that play into us organization and Panthers? I'll, you know, I'll just give you some, you know, I mean, if not only Cointel, Cointel Pro kind of worked to coordinate a much broader opposition that was going on. So for example, I, I, let me just give you a couple of things. Um, 
there's a report. I've, 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 uh, very few, I don't know where you can get a copy of it. By a, a policeman, it was called the Tom's Report, T-H-O-M-S. <laughs> and he went through all of the organizations, uh, all of the programs and self-help organizations in the black community. And he had it on one um, line. And then on the other line, he had all of the militants in, um, in Los Angeles. And he just went down and put an X mm. by every militant who had any association with every, any organization. Mm. When Model Cities came to Los Angeles, they called a special meeting. Now remember, you had had the Black Congress with professionals reaching out through the Black Congress to the black community. They were told, you're gonna have to make a choice. You can be a professional or you can be a militant, but you're not gonna wear both hats and get paid. Good. Because so many, you know, people were organizing and had the money. And they realized that they were, first of all, funding our organizational efforts. Secondly, so then when, when COINTELPRO comes, they were just the icing and on, you know, a much deeper cake because they saw the way in which they could pit the organizations against each other. But it was a part of a much larger Kind of, and, and then you throw in the throw in the gang element and the police. You know, Cointel Pro is a is an important kind of shorthand for what the FBI was up to. But if you really look across the board at, at you know all the both political and the u implications and the use of violence, it was much it was much broader. And and, and the conflicts that um, existed between us and the Panthers were, you know, magnified not just in, in COINTELPRO, but in so many ways that it would be difficult to describe them all. But what about internal problems? Internal problems between the two organizations? No, between the, uh, the US organization having internal problems. Oh, oh within our organization, oh yeah. And the Panthers having internal problems with their own members. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I mean, I'll put it like this. US had internal problems, and, and, and to me, and, uh, you know, I weren't always on the same side of factional division. Um, you know, he was uh, attacked at one point by members of his own organization. But because of the, of the, I think it had a lot to do with the ideology of the organization. The one thing I can say is that to my knowledge, no member of us ever killed any other member of us. I, I, I don't think the Panthers can make that claim. They cannot. No, that's it. That's it. Right there. Okay, uh, this question might have been asked before I got here, but I'm curious. I'm sort of stuck back here a minute. You were speaking of the confrontation you were in. You were told to stand down. And my oh, no, no. If, oh, no. Uh, uh, yeah, we were, t we were explaining during that tumultuous period mm -hmm. after the UCL UCLA incident with us, we were told we could not respond. I mean, we were actually bumping our heads, getting articles together. I mean, because, you know, we didn't have a grasp of public relations. And, 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 and I'll just say this. And at that time, Marlon Correa was stymied. I mean, he, he didn't know how to deal with this. Not really. And, and, and he started to withdraw. So we're out there, and then you start to feel, uh, it's, it's, it's part of it is the arrogance of isolation, but you start to feel like it's you against the world. But if you don't throw back, if somebody's punching you upside your head, you don't throw back. That's terrible. But to be told to have your handcuffs and you can't throw back, and that is when the fundamental change came about. And they had a national publication. But we didn't, we could not say, you might have heard this for the first time. You never heard that, did you? Yeah, um, brother, and to me, I want to mention <coughs> something before I forget. Um, again, about the COINTEL, uh, Brother Halisi made a, a poignant point, so it's part of a larger uh, network. So now, um, just as a point of fact, I have documents that show that um, both the Panthers and us, although it wasn't relegated to just those two organizations, but black power organizations um, in general, mm -hmm. let me name you some of the organizations that were involved no in fostering foment, right? The DIA, uh, DEA, local um, utility companies, right? Cutting off your heat, oh, yeah. cutting off your telephone, um, um, and um, you know IRS, 
right? And even even when it came to um, the Panthers, not so much you all, but even when it came to the Panthers, like airlines, right? So um, whatever was um, fashionable back in the day, Pan, Pan American Rewriting airlines, gun laws. Right? Yes, right. Delivering right. huge stacks of paper, right? Shipments not coming or shipments coming, right? Sodden in oil or right. uh, excrement or water. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Dr. Halisi makes a, uh, a I mean, you, point. You, you take a guy like, I think his name was, I think his first name was William, William Trot. So there was a, there was a district attorney and his whole raison d'etre, his whole reason for existence was to prosecute q mm -hmm. Anytime there was a bus case, he was there. Mm -hmm. After, you know, after the mm -hmm. kind of defeat of, of, of the black organizations in LA, he became um, assistant district attorney. Uh, um, di assistant uh, 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 attorney, yeah. uh, uh, attorney general. He became assistant yeah. attorney general. So you, you kind of get a sense of the tracks <coughs> that you know that 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 um, the suppression of the black organizations, you know, led people. There were people who made big careers as a result. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let me get someone. <laughs> I'll come back to you, brother. Right? In the back there. Maybe the sister right there. will want to uh, actually ask her a question. You know, she didn't actually get to ask her a question. I was just wondering, um, if us is still like an active group, how do you help out in the community with like African American men and being better fathers? Because like, if you look in the communities now, there's a lot of single parent households, a lot of fathers that are in jail, a lot of fathers that aren't in jail and just aren't doing anything at all for their kids. Like, how do you? Um, help them out, or if they're advocate that you know you need to help your black children become prosperous adults, men or women, yes. When I made the, use the phrase, the breakdown of the cultural continuity, what I was also referring to, the generational separation. And the simple fact of the matter is, these young, especially the young brothers, but I, I also emphasize young women because we sometimes we so hung up and talk about the endangered black male. Well, what about the endangered black female? Yes. Them not having father figures affects them a whole other kind of way. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the most rising population right now is black women who are going to prison now. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I don't know if you're, I don't know how this out here, but the female gangs on the East Coast now are running their own drug uh, 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 gangs. Because they just you know, say, bump that, we can do this. But this, this whole thing that we're caught up in, you can't aspire to anything that you don't have an example for. So I don't jam young brothers or young sisters. The thing is, we gotta create the images. But unfortunately, we do a lot of talking about it, but actually getting out there and doing the work. To me, that is the challenge for our survival to win the hearts and the minds of our kids. But they got to develop their own leadership too. Yeah. It is, and one of the things that has happened, far too often we stay on the stage way longer than we should. Yeah. Why have we got the same leaders that I'm hearing that I heard when I, 40 years ago? <laughs> Why is a, 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 a black mayor in Newark there for 20 something years and you didn't develop one brother or sister? <laughs> so what happens is the white progressive organizations they find these brothers and sisters. Cory Booker was not, didn't benefit from uh, what's, uh, Sharp, Sharp James. The Jewish community molded him. That's right. He was head of the B'nai B'rith That's right. at his school. That's real true. Okay? All these cats coming up, nut nutter in Philadelphia. There's a, there's, there's a similarity of style and also of education, but also utilization. What the brother that lost in D.C., what was his name? He was one, uh, he lost, I'm, I'm sorry, it's old Alzheimer's is sitting in, but, oh, you, uh, yeah, you too. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is, there's this whole new uh, 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 plethora of cats coming in, but they haven't been developed by the brothers and sisters that sat in the seat of power. We stay on the stage way longer. I mean, we don't did our duty. We're here to advise, but you can't soldier. Soldiers have to soldier. Right. But, but, but the other thing is we got to be very careful. A lot of us, truth be told, are scared of young kids. I'm not talking about the people in this room, but you know what I'm saying. 
And if you're scared of that which you bring to the world, where's your head really at? I'm sorry, I, I jumped in prematurely, I'm sorry. That's okay, honey. I was just curious as to, you know, when you were mentioned that you were told to stand down, I was curious as who told you to stand down oh, and why did, they, why did they tell you to stand down? Because he, look, we have fundamental differences. I'm saying he froze. He couldn't handle the situation. See, pressure is a mug. You don't really know what it is until it hits you. That's why I mean, I box. So, I mean, it's one thing, I mean, not professionally, but I've seen so many cats to be in the, on, the, on the bag, heavy bag, boom, boom. But it's different when you get in that ring and a mug says, damn, oh, this is for real. And I don't, make, I don't mix no bones about it. He froze, and how the top is, is what happens, that's and that's right. what shot the organization. Right. And we became right. defensive, and we, we couldn't throw. We couldn't throw back. And that was demoralizing for us. Because we, we were soldiers, man. Let's put our own story out. Brother, brother, and two, in, in, in defense of you, not that you need to fit me, right? He was the general, so to speak. Right. This is a paramilitary organization. Right. You're a soldier. He gave the order. You followed the order. Well, I mean, his concern was, was that also that, you know, I mean, he, he didn't think, I mean, he was caught up in the middle of it. And, and, and when Mtumi says he froze, he was caught up in the middle of it. I don't think he ever thought, well, <laughs> Maulana was not, um, you know, he, he, he was not unaware of the need for certain kinds of, you know, paramilitary preparation. But at the same time, you know, when, when, when that happened, I think he had a deep sense of that he was no longer, it wasn't, it wasn't just a struggle between us and the Panthers. He had, um, you know, so you said some consider us enemies of the people. Your program is called the enemies of the state. He realized, I think, that he was fighting. He had enough political science understanding. They've been trained mm -hmm. in science. He knew he was fighting the entire state. Right. And he froze. I'm sure, the Panthers did as well. So, you know, it's, uh, when, when you realize you're up against the state, I think, you know, it takes a certain kind of mentality to deal with it. It does. It does. Right here. I, I have a, a, a comment and then a, then a question yes, for sir. you. Um, Brother Fumi, correct? Yes, sir. I, I hear you keep talking about Newark, New Jersey. Yes, uh, sir. Are you there now? Uh, no, I'm, you know, I'm still in Jersey. I'm in South Orange. Okay. So I, that's about 12 minutes outside. Okay, good. I, I, was, I wanted to make a comment. We, I just worked on a project for about two years in Newark. Um, is where, there, where, where? Georgia King Village. Okay. Uh, right off the market. Yeah. And uh, one of the worst areas, uh, they say, in Newark and in the West Ward. And we took our project, our program, that we have a, a company called Task Force and a youth organization called Young People in Action. Uh -huh. And we took it to Newark and they, they said, what, what can you do in, in here? Because we can't find a way to solve the problems. Well, six months later, we reduced crime in the area by 75%. Cory Booker then had a press conference, didn't see any of the paperwork. The day he saw the paperwork was when he was standing in front of the microphones and said, look at the great things that we had done. And <laughs> <laughs> not us. <laughs> we had done. And so uh, uh, Newark now as, uh, was the organization he started when he lost against, um, um, what's his Sharp name? James. Sharp. Yeah, Sharp James. When he lost against Sharp James, he created Newark now. And you know, you know. That well, right now, Cory Booker, so, so you just know this. He won't even come into black people. Oh, right, yeah. Because they, right. they dog it because, and again, the murders. Newark, for, man, Newark is, come on, man, it's that big. And Newark is 26 square miles. And, and we, we had a murder. It's crazy. It's we've had three, almost three murders a week. Yes. Okay? And Newark ain't big as your backyard. Yes. And he has not responded for a couple of reasons. Politically, he doesn't want to do it because he's going to try to run for government. Yes, he right. So he don't want to be attached to the, the real mess that Newark has become. So what he's done, what he's, what, what he's, the, the new thing he's done, he, he doesn't, he doesn't even call the parents. Every mayor does that. Bloomberg even does it. Yes, you does. call, he give you condolences, so he stays away. He had, he had a project where they drove around the city uh, in, in, in caravans and he was going to neighborhoods, but they never got out the truck to no, no, he, he, he So we were saying, talk to the people. But so, so I guess my question for you is, I'm, I'm 
I'm probably around. I'm 45. I'm 65. Um, see, and so because you had, you had made a, a, a statement about it, so and so when I look at that, we have young people in action. We've been around 28 years. We have about 20,000 young people that we train in leadership. And so we look at we looked at that. My question for you is is that people always talk about air and dirty laundry. You know, it used to be we knew who our enemy was, but now they look like us. So my question for you is is that you know how do we air that dirty laundry, brother? We have. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to no, no, no. <laughs> and, and, and I, I want to close this part with this. I fundamentally believe it's best to tell the truth, the good parts and the bad parts. Yes. Because if you don't give the bad parts, you expose the next generation to make the same mistake. History doesn't repeat itself. People repeat People, history. Right. And right. we've been, right. sometimes we glorify certain periods a little bit too much. And it's like, you know, and I said, I always use music as a, as a parallel. It's like old head musicians, oh, that music, that ain't nothing, that ain't music. Well, that's their music. You have to respect that. That's right. But we have not really been all that, because it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated period. But there's had, there hasn't been enough truth said about it. It's important to say what we did. It's also important to document where it went wrong. Because yeah. if you don't do that, it'll just... Well, thank just you. one thing on that. Speaking of Mia Copas, thank you. Um, I, I think that, and it came up a little earlier, uh, and and this is true of, of of both organizations. I mean, both and and our sisters have certainly, our feminist sisters have certainly pointed this out to us over many years. The kind of masculinist mythology that grew up, <laughs> in, that you know, that grew up in the in, in the in the Black Power movement. Whether it took the form of lumpen proletarianism. Um, I've read women who have critiqued lumpen proletarianism said that it was in some ways a disguised kind of masculinity um, and, and tended to valorize, you know, uh, a kind of male. Us, you know, was, was a polygamous organization. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> he tried to be a polygamous organization. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that's one of the issues. But, on the leadership question that Mtume, you know, makes a good point on, somebody who is as routine a media person as Gwen Eichel has written a book talking about the fact that the locus of black leadership uh, used to come out of movements. The elected officials then kind of, some movement people became elected officials. Now, that, that leadership is being created yes. by elite institutions, yes. um, comes out of elite institutions, um, and it's a movement that, you know, that claims to represent us, right. but how they represent us and, and whether they represent us is something I think that we really need to start to discuss. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that may be a bit off the point, but it's something, it, it, it's something to really think about. A few more questions, Dr. Austin? Yeah. I'm I want to go back to the a point you made about uh, impact. And oh, image implications of impact. Right, and, and about uh, truth. I'm just curious to know the difference between the two of you. We've been talking about the Panthers and us for a while now. So, all right, we know that the Panthers had guns, and now it's been brought out here that us was a paramilitary organization, and they had guns. And we know what the Panthers were doing with their guns. And so, my one question is, what was us doing with its guns? And the second question is about COINTELPRO. Like, we know that COINTELPRO decimated the ranks of the Panthers, particularly the leadership. Can you talk about the leadership of us? I just, and, want, to talk, I, I just want to talk about the guns, you know, Negroes with guns. Um, <laughs> um, what, you know, people think that we didn't, that we didn't have principal discussion, uh, and it was just random. But us and the Panthers had engaged uh, at meetings and even in black Congress meetings. Us, us's position was, if you parade guns, if you take guns up to the Sacramento State House rather than picket signs, hmm. all you're doing is mobilizing the police. Mm -hmm. Funds poured into LA to buy tanks, to create SWAT, the whole thing. So our position was, you know, be armed, talk culture. Um, but if anybody thought us was just cultural, 
they didn't know what us was about. So, I mean, it was a really, just like about how you move out from city to city, how you, you know, how you deal with self-defense. Because remember, all of those organizations that came in after Malcolm's assassination, no more, no more nonviolent organizations. Uh, you had a continuum from anywhere from self-defense to, you know, RAM, you know, or, you know, the, the Black Revolutionary Army or whatever. So violence, the, the nonviolent wing lost out amongst the, the new youth wing. And, 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 and that may be another legacy that we have to come to grips with in terms of where we are with you today. Mm -hmm. but, um, but us's position was uh, to be armed, but not to, to display arms. And um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the police and the FBI certainly didn't think us was um, was an organization that, that was not armed. Although in, in the propaganda, the partisan propaganda war that, that developed, you know, this kind of idea that all we did was sing and, and, and do the boot dance mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, has, 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 has become prevalent. And that movie did help, Panther. Right. 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 That movie did help at all. I'm sorry, but No, we know that us using his guns, I mean, that, that's pretty clear. But I'm glad you got the mic because you were going to make a comment about impact. My thing is COINTELPRO uh, saw a leader like a Martin Luther King, saw a leader like a Stokely Carmichael, saw somebody like Bob Moses or Fannie Lou Hammer and did certain things to them. I'm trying to find out what uh, actions were directed at the us leadership that would <laughs> decimate them. We were under it, brother. And, I mean, that's a, a very interesting <laughs> point. What was directed at us, and, I, and like I said, I. <clears throat> Years later, was able to get some of my papers. <laughs> and to sit here and tell you, you know, I'm not, look, I'm not no punk, but they was like, whoa, they knew that? Then you begin to understand that this thing is way deeper than you even think. Yes. And, it's not, I'm not a, and I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm talking about, how many see? James and Jubay went from here to there, to the Western Union, to pick up X amount of money, to get it back. And you know what? It was all true. I been to, I didn't see nobody behind me. <laughs> so when you start to add that pressure, which goes back to what Alicia alluded to, it was an immense pressure happening. And also, you know what, I, I, if I maybe to be honest with it, part of the impact was, it's almost, you can't believe this is happening to us. Because all we did was try to out, and, and, and to become the enemy. Okay, because all the information, as I said, I brought that movie, the, if y'all saw episode of the Panther movie, how we would display as scary guys that were scared of guns. I was so mad I produced a couple tracks for it, but anyway. <laughs> but the reality is, it, it, it's very, very serious. And, but you can't run from it. You know, it's almost, we, we had to understand that was part of it. Because every other great person and leader had to crack through that ice. But, but I want to address one thing real quick. You brought up something. And I think this is something we need to rethink. How often we talk about, well, if Malcolm was here, or if Martin Luther King, what would they think? No, oh, they're dead. I respect those brothers here. But we're the only community that makes reference to people who are not alive. And ask them what would they think. They can't. They gave us a baton. That's right. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? We talk in old terms. We're the only ethnic group that talks about the black leader. Well, who's the leader of the Italians? Who's the leader of the Irish? Come on. Who's the Puerto Rican leader? Yeah. No such thing, but we do that, and it keeps getting one or two people in the mail. Mm -hmm. Because we think like that, because white media pushes that. This week is Al Sharpton. Oh, he's a, Jesse's out. Jesse's in. Al's over there. <laughs> But we do that and we let and we let them reduce our brain trust to one person. Yes, sir. No other community does that. That's right. That's right. And we gotta rethink that. Right. No such thing. That's a horse and buggy approach to a space age problem. Right. It's stupid, get rid of it. Uh, brother, brother, to my um, brother Lisa, I don't know if you all are um, aware of this and maybe you are. And this speaks to uh, Dr. Austin's question. So <coughs> You may remember 
you, remember, you may remember Dr. Karengo meeting with um, Ronald Reagan, right? Well, I mean, I don't know if you all know this, but that was leaked by an LA journalist. That meeting, right? Um, there were several other meetings that us members, as yeah, well as Dr. Karengo, yeah, yeah, right? I never right? That. Took place that involved whites, right? That the um, um, FBI had journalists mm -hmm. on that payroll mm -hmm. leaked those stories. But he also with met with Bobby Kennedy. He said, it's, 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 it's politically smart. Right. So, 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 mm -hmm. so, um, a number of journalists, there were two or three um, in particular who worked for the LA Times, who leaked these stories with the express purpose of painting us in a way that groups like the Panthers and members in the black community can use to jump to conclusion. Oh, they meet with the white man. They meet right. with the enemy. Right. Right. So I don't want that to go unnoticed. That's a that's a great point. That's a great point. Would you say somebody is about to back to Alexander? Um, I was curious to know. Yeah, a lot of doctors did that. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious this to know. Leslie? What was that? Are you Leslie Alexander? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I went to Oswald. I saw you there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um. I'm curious to know what you think about Milana Karenga and Kawaita theory today. Um, and I'm particularly curious to know also about what you think about the sort of proliferation across the country of certain aspects of Kawaita theory, like how Kwanzaa has become, you know, this thing. So I'm kind of curious to know what you think about that now. I'm also curious to know um, what you think about the scholarship. You mentioned before some of the, the, the new generation of um, scholars who are doing, you know, various studies on black power organizations. So I'm curious to know what you think about the scholarship, maybe like Scott Brown's book or any of the other scholarship that you've kept up with. Yeah, I, I would, I would like to say some, something, something, say something. What I think, you know, gets at that. Um, I mean, you've seen Malithi Asante's book on Maulana, uh, you know, claiming that he's one of the great cultural theorists of America, et cetera. You know, it, 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 one of the, and then we've kind of talked about the relation between us and the Panthers, and, and then too many talk about the intellectual aspect that attracted us. You know, Maulana had a very interesting thing that he, he decided to do. So, uh, whereas the Panthers might read Mao and, uh, and we used to read the Red Book, and they might read Marx and et cetera, Maulana had, it, had the approach that he would he had had an education. He, he, you know, as I said, was an AVD from UCLA. He would synthesize all of these books and then disseminate them as as doctrine points. Now, you know, at 19 and 20 years old, you know, this was some pretty heavy stuff to, him, <laughs> you know, because he was talking about the okay, the three types of revolution. You know, the Lenin model, the Trotsky model, the Mao model. Um, but in a way, you know, he dis he discouraged um, he discouraged us from, you know, reading more broadly, you know, on our own. I was the kind of anytime he dropped the name of a book, you know, I was at the library of the bookstore that day, you know, because I wanted to try to find out what was underneath this kind of, you know, his 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 attempt to keep a control over the creation you know, of, uh, of Kawaita. Kwanzaa, uh, the young guy who wrote the book on this, uh, wrote the book on Kwanzaa, uh, I, I talked with him. I think that um, there is a positive aspect of uh, cultural nationalism that has, you know, had a lasting, had a lasting impact. Um, and, and for those of us who went on to, to get, to, like myself, to become you know, some kind of a scholar in his own right, um, you know, it was a very important period, but, you know, as you begin to read more broadly, learn more broadly, um, much of it, you know, still has value, but much of it was, you know, was just that. It was, you know, it, it, it was a beginning step for, you know, for, for me on, on the path to critical thinking. That's a very interesting question. For me, it's still part of it. I mean, my kids are 40-something years old. They don't know anything else but celebrating Kwanzaa. 
There's certain things that are institutionalized in us. And we still measure things within that framework, even though we evolve to other stuff. But what you began to realize, and that, and that was what I was referring to, Halisi, about we kind of thought we would be sent to Detroit or, you know. But I began to understand and digest it in terms of the, 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 the pitfalls of deification. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was fundamentally flawed, as I look back on it, I began to reassess it. All these organizations were pretty much cult of personality. The only thing that was different about Elijah Muhammad, he moved from cult of personality to cult of prophecy. You know, but he also developed the next level. There, it wouldn't have been no Malcolm without Elijah. It wouldn't have been no Farrakhan. It wouldn't have been all the bad, those bad ministers. But fundamentally, we have worked off the deification factor. Mm -hmm. And my point is, no black person in this country can handle that. So what you begin to do, if that becomes your vicarious validation. Right. You know? Right. So we all, again, we all shut down. So, but the deification factor, I began to understand organization like it has to be organizational. Like, for example, every four years we vote, we get ready to vote for a new one right now, a new one, president. The personality may change, but the office of the presidency goes on forever. We never had that. Absolutely. Who gonna move Jesse Jackson out of uh, Operation Push? Maybe Shove. But the, <laughs> the bottom line is that was one of the, in retrospect, it was necessary, like that was it, but it wasn't sufficient because when those leaders go right down the line, you, you and Luke, uh, Malcolm, uh, Baraka, Stokely, all of them, when they fell out, the damage that was done to all of us, the people who followed them, because we looked to one person. Until we have organizational leadership, it'll always fall to that. Now, I do know that's predicated on the, uh, back in the day, the preacher was the guy that the white people talked to. And he cooled the rest of us out. But we operated off a syndrome. Black, the concept of black leadership itself has to be redefined. One more question, mm -hmm. Dr. Brooks? Yeah, well, I connect with a question about the scholarship with your proposition of uh, a new cultural movement, uh, cultural nationalist movement around values and the trajectory of black males. I want to remind us that there are an incalculable number of good fathers out there who not only father their children, but cho other people's children as, as well. And there are numerous rites of passage programs and other types of mentoring programs for both boys and for both girls, or black boys and black girls. But what we don't see, or what we're beginning to see very little of, is the black family, the role of the male and the female together, mm -hmm. and having black families mentor other black families, and any fundamental uh, research on ancient Africa will show you that black men walked right alongside with black women, not one before the other. So would you be able to speak to that? Well, I think that if, if those programs are good, I, I, and I didn't mean to demean in any way or, or to suggest that there aren't real programs going on. But I've been dealing with hardcore violence for the last 10 years. We hold forums all around the state of New York, Connecticut, and, and, and uh, New Jersey. And I deal with the gangs personally. I go in there. I meet with them. Because I think you, you can't really <coughs> help somebody if you don't know what they're suffering from. Right. And again, image implication and impact, we tend, we, we tend to dismiss them as because we don't want to deal with that. That's why as black people, we don't respond when a black kid is killing another black kid, but Trayvon Martin happens, horrible incident, right. but why do we go 30,000 30, people? We're marching and blah, blah, blah. And I always ask if Zimmerman was black, that case would have never hit the fan. That's the truth about us. And I, that's, I, again, that goes back to what I'm saying. I'm trying to look in the mirror as best I can. And I'm as flawed as anybody. But we have fundamental flaws that we got to turn around. You got hundreds, thousands of black men. There were, what, 5,000 murders last year. Black men murdering black men. Right. 
I ain't talking about white cops, but we let a white cop shoot somebody with an outrage. Right. But what do we do? Wait, where's our head? Because nobody wants to deal with that. That's the hard work. But I know there are organizations that I applaud all of them. I'm personally down with, my work has been the last 10 years, dealing with gangs. Because I think fundamentally, the cultural change is going to have to come from them. Please join me in thanking our esteemed guest, Mr. James <laughs> <laughs>